Okay. So if you guys can, I do ask that you guys please turn on turn on your cameras. It does help the course conversation. Um, who would like to start off discussing what was talked about in your particular breakout room? So we have the cultural bomb question. Uh, we have the question around how does the cultural bomb relate to code switching? And then, which I'm more interested in, to be honest with you, how was your experience with the homework assignment over the weekend as far as not code switching? So, uh, there, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so during our group discussion, we were talking about the the um cultural bomb and like the effects that it that Ngugi was talking about. So as stated in the in the reading, he was saying that it acts like a like a bomb to annihilate a person's beliefs. And then it says a person's beliefs in their names, their language, and their environment. So basically their whole entire culture. Mm -hmm. And it acts like as a way for them to be kind of like ashamed of mm -hmm. their culture in a way and try to distance themselves from their culture. So I feel like and to tie that with like the code switching one, I was like, it kind of like correlates because like there's your certain group of friends that you act a certain way. And then there's another set of friends that you act a certain way because of like, you feel like they won't understand like mm -hmm. your, like they don't understand your language or they won't understand like the context of like what you're trying to te tell them. So that's why it kind of goes together in like goes with one another. Absolutely. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, yeah. Anyone else want to chime in? Um, either add to what Ricardo mentioned or take it in a different direction or even discuss about your experience with the homework assignment of the weekend. Um, for the homework assignment over the weekend, um, I'm a security guard at, at for like the football games every weekend and stuff, like at SoFi Stadium. Okay. And uh, so I'm always seeing a lot of people and stuff. And it was pretty easy to like just be myself and uh, talk to like different people. It wasn't really an issue. So Damien, when you work, do you normally like put on a professional voice or take like on a professional persona? Damien? I'm sorry, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. Um, yeah, they, they just tell us to uh, just be professional about it. But um, at the end of the day, they, they let us be ourselves. We just can't like cuss and stuff. Um, but, but yeah, we, um, it's not really like a fake um, anything. But yeah, I'm cool. Like I'm, I'm cool with like everyone though. It's pretty cool. It's not okay. that bad. So you didn't have to, um, so at your job sounds like fortunately for you, you don't have to code switch per se. You there allow you to kind of be yourself and that's acceptable correct yeah that's yeah. correct okay perfect who else wants to um comment on their experience with the homework assignment nick did you get a chance to do the homework assignment over the weekend uh i well i'd say the same as the other person i don't really uh code switch i'd say you don't code switch are you bilingual yeah, I am. And you I speak both uh, English and Spanish. E equally, so no matter where you're at, you'll do both? Yeah, it's just like whenever I feel like it. All right, perfect. Um, who else wants to share? I, I could either you could either volunteer or be voluntold. It's up to you. Um, I would like to volunteer. Okay. Um, about the homework assignment, in my work, usually I tend to speak like, which I believe is the main um, language in here, which is English. And me trying to speak in Spanish, like actually we had a problem about that. Um, one of the nurses that I work with, she is from Egypt. And her, the only language that she's, it, well, that she's able to speak with us is obviously English. And uh, one of the girls that works also with us um, speaks um, Spanish. And I try to communicate with her with Spanish and English so that we like, she can also like be learning, can learn English at the same time that we're speaking Spanish. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, the the nurse who's from Egypt heard us and she came up to us and she got really mad about it. I, in some way I understand because you don't, like if you get in her shoes, you don't really know 
if she maybe she thinks that we're talking about her or maybe she feels uncomfortable because she can jump into the conversation but it's to me was also a little disrespectful because um she came up to us like just don't speak spanish like i i don't understand what you're saying so don't speak it in a mean way you know if she would have came to us in a more respectful respectful way would have been a little different yeah yeah, and that's, I think, part of the homework assignment, right, was two parts. One, how do you feel when you're not code switching? And then two, being attentive to how others around you respond to you not code switching. And I think for you, um, the, the woman who you're spoken, speaking to or speaking with from Egypt, right, you were attentive to the way that she responded to you not code switching. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also interesting, especially with uh, migrant communities who come to the United States from other places, um, they very much so adapt this false notion of patriotism that often um, blurs the lines between patriotism and racism. They, they're really quick to, you know, latch onto these things because they believe this is how it is to be American, right? So I think that's also a part of the, that phenomenon as well. Um, who else wants to share? Let's get one to two more. Samina, did you get a chance to do the assignment? Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. You said that I get a chance to do the assignment. Uh huh. Yeah, hold on. Give me one second. Sure. You told me. <sighs> Sorry. You can just talk yeah, about it. You have to read the journal. Just kind of talk about the experience. What was it again? I did it. I just can't think of it. The um, code switch. So where if you were normally would code switch, don't do that and kind of see what happens. Oh, no, I speak I speak Arabic. So I don't really, um, I'm, it's not really a big code switch. People who speak Arabic mostly speak English too. Okay. So I don't really go through a lot of code switches. Most of the time when I'm around, when I'm speaking Arabic, they also speak English, so because it was taught to me, so I don't really go through a lot of code switch. I know a little bit of Spanish, but not to code switch. Right, and then again, it does not have to be strictly from the standpoint of language, right? Um, it could be um, how you speak, not necessarily the language that you use, but the the syntax and the vernacular that you use also could be a a, 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 word, a code switching. Um, how you dress could be interpreted as so code switching. Um, the gender roles that you perform could be used as a form of code switching. Um, but that, I, I thank you guys for, for those who were able to participate for the, in the homework assignment, and I thank you guys for who shared. Um, let me do this. I'll go through my notes on the reading, and then we'll transition into our fishbowl, and from there move into classroom conversation. So um, we've read the opening chapter and the introduction to this book um, by Ngugi Wa Thiango. Uh, decolonizing the mind, uh, the politics of language and, and African literature. Um, and Gugi Wathiango is actually a professor at UC Irvine. Um, so he's actually accessible as well. Um, still writing, he's still publishing. He's also an individual like Karanga, who you can reach out to. And, you know, if you have some inquiries about his work or just about language as a whole. Um, so for me, the things that I found of interest in this text in um, the first, what he calls the statement, right? Not before you kind of get into the actual introduction. In the statement, he tells us that this is the this book, Decolonizing the Mind, was in Googie's farewell to the English language. And going forward, he'll be using his native tongue, Kikuyu, or uh, Kiswahili. He's from Kenya, right? So to me, this, I interpreted it as Ngugi saying, I will no longer code switch to English to produce my text, right? I'm going to honor my native tongue and produce my work in my native tongue. Um, and then he makes a very interesting claim to me. And, and he says, he talks about the tribalism in Africa, right? And he says, too, far too often, the study of African realities has for too long 
been seen in terms of tribes, right? So what happens in Kenya, Uganda, et cetera, et cetera, is about what tribe A did to tribe B and what tribe C did to tribe B, D, right? But he says we need to kind of expand our reality behind beyond this tribalism that was set in place by colonial entity. And then he gives us the um, his musings on the cultural bomb on page three. And, and Ricardo articulated it perfectly and I'll just read the passage where he pulls the cultural bomb from. The oppressed and, ex and the exploited of the earth maintain their defiance, liberty from theft. But the biggest weapon wielded and actually daily unleashed by imperialism against that, collect that collective defiance is the cultural bomb. The effect of a cultural bomb is to annihilate a people's belief in their names, their languages, in their environments, in their heritage of struggle, in their unity, in their capacities, and ultimately in themselves. So as Ricardo said, the cultural bomb just causes you to devalue some of the um, things that you see as in, innate or indigenous to yourself, right? Um, he also makes the claim that the choice of language is central to a people's definition of themselves in the relation to their natural and social environments, right? And the way that they relate to the, nat to the entire universe. And to me, this reminds me of, of what we read last week from Somme in the sense that your language will dictate your reality, right? And, and, and Gooby's saying the same thing, but in a roundabout way, right? Because it's gonna dictate how you relate to nature and how you relate to the social, right? And then he has, he spends a great, amount of time on, in the text on this conference um, of writers of English and the African expression. And he said there's a contradiction or a um, disconnect between the conference on African writers of English expression. Who could tell me or who could state what the contradiction is that uh, Ngugi articulated or recognized through um, this conference? And I mean, really, the name of the conference highlights the contradiction, right? African writers of English expression. And then he goes on to say, right, so here I am a student and I've only published two small short stories and I'm able to attend the conference, but some of the greatest poets in Kenya and Nigeria who only write in their native languages are not able to attend the conference, right? So where's the contradiction there? Where is the contradiction within this conference, the conference of African writers and the English expression? It seems to have a focus on the English language and kind of like, um, usually, usually talks about European languages, but in this context is more the English language as the priority and while they're supposed to be talking about um the african cultures and writers and literature things like that absolutely right and, he, and then they go on to pose the question so what is african literature is it literature that's written about africa is it literature that's written in the african language right so this these are some of the things that they pose within the conference but then Google says we're not dealing with the real issue here of african writers using their colonial language to articulate their stories right and that's the contradiction um, and to me, he poses a very wonderful question. Um, he says, how do we as African writers come to be so feeble towards the claims of our language on us and so aggressive in our claims on other languages, particularly the languages of our colonization, right? So, as African writers, we're so weak in our response to defending our own native languages, right? But we will we'll aggressively defend the language of our oppressor. And he asked the question, you know, how do we get to this state, right? What happened for this to take place? And again, I bring this up to get you guys to think about the questions that you pose in your journal, right? There's three types of questions, questions for understanding, questions that will um, produce further research, and questions that produce a critique. And this question that Igugi poses is the second question, right? He could do a whole research or write another book 
on how do African, how did African peoples become so feeble in defending their own languages, right? So I just wanted to point you guys, point this out to you guys, so you can start thinking about expanding the type of questions that you have. And then he um, he closes the passage with this: the bullet was means of physical subjugation. Language was the means of spiritual subjugation. I'll read that one more time: the bullet was the means of physical subjugation. Language was the means of spiritual subjugation. What does that mean? The bullet subjugated the body, language subjugated the spirit. What does that mean? What does it mean to be subjugated? What does subjugation mean? Uh, I'm just going to take a guess and, and say uh, subjugation would be kind of like put it, being put under the rule or like under the leadership of someone else, right? To, to be oppressed, you know, to, um, to be under the rule of, absolutely. So we know that subjugate means to oppress, to rule, right? So if Ngugi claims that the bullet, right, subjugated the body, and language subjugated the spirit. What is what is he saying? What is he trying to get at here? I think when when he talks about like the bullet, like oppressing is kind of like the action of being like damaged. So like the damage that the bullet does on the body. Well, yeah, on the body. And then what you said, language is like the it, like it was says like in this context it would be like language is damaging like the the spirit or the soul what, what did you say the spirit or the soul yeah absolutely yeah yeah so it's the main thing that's causing like, this kind of like catastrophic damage to like a person's like spirit inside is because of the language or the language barrier that that is being put like toward like on them right and and when you say the the language barrier ricardo it's the, the it's the imposed language right so when i talked about last week the missions that we all had to do um living in california i believe in fourth or fifth grade right in those missions you weren't able to speak your native language and if you were caught speaking your native language you would be violently assaulted right so he's talking about that damage that the bullet has done to the body if you get shot right how it rips through your flesh having to speak the oppressor's language or having to suppress your native language does as just as much damage as the bullet does to the body to your own, to your own soul right and this is what he's trying to get us to understand and get us to recognize the um the power and the freedom in speaking one's native language right and how to always capitulate to the oppressor's language is to let loose that cultural bomb right is to take show a disdain for your native culture your native language your native being right and this is the the point this is the thesis behind in Google's work so let's try if there's no questions um we'll transition into the fishbowl is there one is there any questions and then if not is there anyone who wants to volunteer for the fishbowl i'll volunteer for the fishbowl Got you, Ricardo. Anyone else? Uh, I'll, I'll go after. Uh, Damien? Okay, I got you. Anyone else? All right. Um, Alyssa, are you prepared to fishbowl today? If we already did it once, do we have to do it again? You have to do two semester. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll go today. Okay. And then you're done for the semester. Okay. So okay. Um, if I call you again, just let me know that, you know, I'm done for the semester and you're good to go. All right. So um, whoever wants to start it off, it's on you. Uh, I'll go. Okay. So I was going to talk about how we were in our groups where our, our breakout rooms and we were talking and I had a Alyssa in my group and we we're talking about the code switching. So we were talking about that and she was saying that how her I think she said her mom's boyfriend doesn't speak English. So 
she she used that example and it made me think about like how I use that with my sister's boyfriend because he's he's like he's from here so he was born here so he doesn't speak like any other language just English and I like noticed that whenever he's there with our our parents that my parents have to like switch on to like English when like it's like even if it's in our own household where we speak primarily Spanish like just to make him feel comfortable we we try to speak as much English as we can and every single thing like if he's like oh what is like she said like we try to like translate it to the best of our knowledge just so he could be like comfortable in here and I saw like that wasn't that wasn't like the main example I used for like the code switching assignment but when she mentioned that it made me like rethink I was like another form of like code switching so yeah that's a it was really interesting to, to see that yeah and, and I think that that's a little bit unique because that that's more so in the space of being accommodating and respectful almost mm -hmm. just because um, to avoid, um, I believe it was Arcelli who was saying at her job, you know, she had a lady kind of run up on her for speaking English or for not speaking yeah. English. Yeah, kind of that's yeah. how that, that plays out, right? But no, mm -hmm. you're, you're right. It's the same thing, though, right? It's kind of putting one culture aside to pick up and honor another. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so can you the fishbowl too? Like, you can add me in there in the list? Yeah. I could go right now. Like, I don't know if somebody else wants to go first or I don't know. Um, if there's no objections for Jaime going first, I'm okay with it. Go, ahead. go for it. Oh, all right, all right. So, uh, like what um, Ricardo was saying about that code switching, about the language and stuff. I have neighbors that were born here and they don't talk. Uh, they don't. They don't speak Spanish. It's just primarily English. And I see. I see them. I have. I see them as like my. I see. Uh, yeah. There's. Um, I see him as an uncle and he has kids that are one of them is 13 and the other one's seven and they don't know uh, none, nothing of Spanish. So I'll be having them with me majority of the time wherever I go and I just be talking Spanish to them and stuff because they're very young and they could like learn Spanish very quickly because of how young they are, especially the seven year old. The seven year old could learn a little quicker than the 13 year old, but they're learning little by little speaking Spanish. And then sometimes when they don't understand stuff, I try to like translate as best as I can in English for they can understand what I'm saying in Spanish. And I do the same thing uh, uh, with my uncle. I do. I try to do the same thing with him. He understands Spanish, but there's some things he don't understand, and I translate it to him too as well. And like I've been doing this for like the past year or two, and like little by little learning Spanish, and they and they are speaking a little by little as well. Yeah. So you're kind of um, doing what Ngugi's doing in the sense of trying to get them to honor their native language, right, and their native culture by teaching them Spanish. Yeah, that's that's very dope, Jaime. Mean. Um, we have Alyssa and Damien. Um, I want to go ahead and speak on my code switching assignment this weekend. Um, as Ricardo mentioned, my mom's boyfriend does not speak um, Spanish. He only speaks English. Um, he does understand Spanish. And your assignment really made me realize to, um, if he understands it, why not speak more more of it in front of him so he can go ahead and adapt to words and like it can get stuck into his head and he can kind of learn because my whole family speaks Spanish especially my grandma like she speaks no English she also understands it but like to a, a minimal point so I really this weekend especially since my mom was gone she went to um, Portland Oregon um, I've been having a lot more conversations with him so I did speak a lot more Spanish instead of English Yes, that's dope. Um, Damien? All right, so what I got from the reading was, um, it was like a, there's like ongoing challenges with just being himself with his culture and his uh, native language. And um, I just, what I got from this was, uh, we're just lucky to be like in a position to speak our minds and to uh, not have this problem. I mean, still people still face this problem. Um, personally, being from like a Hispanic family, it's kind of like weird going to like different cities and um, like say my grandma speaks Spanish in front of like a lot of people. Like I feel the tension and stuff. Like um, say there's like a white family and uh, they just speak, my grandma speaks Spanish with us. Um, I could like feel the tension just like, like in positions like that. Um, but it doesn't really bother me now. I don't think it ever did, but I could see how other people uh, that live in other cities uh, face that challenge every day. You know, I, I think um, it's interesting how those who talked about, uh, especially in the fishbowl, how they had attacked the assignment in the sense of, you know, teaching Spanish to others. 
um, and how generative that is for blending and merging those cultures. Um, so for me, my wife is from Eritrea. It's a country in East Africa, like above Ethiopia, and they speak Tedenya. So her parents speak it. Um, she understands it. She speaks it minimally. But when I go over there, I don't speak it right, but they don't speak English, right? And they do that to help me to learn the language. Um, when they speak to my kids, they all speak to them in Tedenya, right? So my kids can start understanding and learning the language. So there is something um, to be said about using your native tongue in spaces where someone may not understand it. And although it can be perceived as disrespectful in Arcelli's case, right? Um, it could also be interpreted as an opportunity to learn, depending on the presentation and depending on the person who is alienated from the language, how they're able to interpret and to um, interact with, you know, hearing another language. Um, I don't understand the phenomenon of languages outside of English being offensive to someone who only speaks English. Like, I, I, I really, really don't understand why that offends you. Um, I do get right. It's, it's the um, it's also then on the other side. It's the um, idea of the black woman going into the nail salon, and you know, historically Korean women um, run the hair salon, especially in LA, right? And then them speaking that the language to where they feel like they're talking about them. So yes, I understand that. But by and large, outside of those contexts, why would you be offended by someone else's language? Like, well, why is that offensive to you? Why does that take away from who you are? Because someone can express who they are in a different vernacular, right? Um, it, it's really, really bizarre to me. Uh, but thank you for those who did Fishbowl. Um, let's open it up to course conversation. Uh, we could discuss anything in the reading, anything in your uh, Fishbowl, breakout rooms, etc. cetera, anything's on the table. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the reading. Um, so I would like to, add a comment yeah. or I don't know if it's like a point of view that I just noticed um like you're saying teaching someone else well yeah teaching someone else their native language or trying to teach teach them other type of languages it's like something that it's not disrespectful it's really understandable and comprehensive and really nice you know yeah. but when it comes to someone being aggressive about the language the, the language that you're speaking that's when things like change drastically because they can come up with you and be like oh look um i don't speak it would you like to teach me would you like to let me know so we can have this type of like conversation or mm, or, or like an open mind um way of thinking but when they come to us being like i said negative that's like a different type of situation so i noticed that if you come to them asking them in a nice way or asking for some help it's different you know like it, it the, that moment hits different but when they come to you in a negative way that also like gives you a more negative vibe, which is not really acceptable. Yeah. And I think too, um, it kind of goes back to the theme that has been running through, you know, the whole semester so far is this notion of relations, right? Um, teaching that language, approaching someone respectfully, that's going to help build to that relation. That's going to help create that positive relation. Um, and not doing so is going to help erode this notion of relations and continue to promote strife in society that, that we're dealing with where you have these cultural um, conflicts. Who else has some thoughts about the reading? How did this reading feel to you guys juxtaposed to like um, last week's reading with um, Somme or even um, the reading on my eye? Was this difficult? Was this easily to digest? How did you feel about the reading? I felt like it was more difficult. I had to kind of um, reread like the paragraphs to grasp the information that was being given to us. Okay. Like that's just what I had to do. Anyone else find this a little bit more difficult? Yeah, I agree with, with uh, what Alyssa said. I, I was reading it and I had to like reread some of the paragraphs to like understand what I was uh, reading and stuff. 
Anyone else? Because because I, I agree. Um, like some of the sentence structures and the phrasings are, are a little off to me. And I, and I think that is due to the translation, right? I, I think that's a byproduct of Ngugi trying to work out thoughts and uh, Kukuyu and then translate them to English. And that's why it may seem kind of clunky and not flow as fluid as some of the other texts that we've read in the past may have. But um, this notion of language, and I, I think everyone kind of picked up on that, right? Because um, a lot of our conversation we're having is very um, is language based. But when we think about how not only in Google articulates the, the importance of language, um, but also how Somme in, articulates this notion of language, it, it, it makes you, for me at least, right? It makes me think about it differently. It makes me think about how I so choose to um, articulate and express myself differently. Um, again, I may have mentioned this in the past, but for me, I look at um, what they call AAV, African-American uh, vernacular, as a, as a separate language, or what they may call Ebonics as a separate language. Um, Anybody familiar with the Oakland area? Anybody spent some time up north, Oakland, nothing like that? Uh, so in Oakland, there is a very strong dialect. They have like the, what I call an Oakland accent. Like if I, I could pick out a motherfucker from Oakland just by hearing them talk, like I'll know exactly where you're from. Um, and there's an interesting history as it pertains to Oakland and language. There was a sociologist who um, is a, I don't know if he was born in Nigeria or his parents were from Nigeria, but he did the majority of his work here in the States. His name is John Agu. And in the mid nineties, he was doing some research in Oakland schools. And what's fascinating, during this time in the mid nineties, there was great conversation around should Ebonics be recognized as an official language. And so as this conversation's picking up in the mid nineties, this school in Oakland um, actually, it's a school district in Oakland, excuse me. Um, they take on this project and they say, we're going to recognize Ebonics as a actual language, as a, as a dual language. So when they would give class lectures and things of that nature, they would allow space for Ebonics to kind of take its um, space in the classroom, right? They would allow the students to express themselves using Ebonics. They wouldn't um, pin them into speaking the standard vernacular English expression, right? And so what I found is a lot of people around my age who are from Oakland, um, who kind of made it to the mainstream, they don't do the, the, the linguistic or the vernacular code switch. They speak in that, what we may call Ebonics, right? So I don't know if you're familiar with um, sports, if you're uh, familiar, if you like football, um, Marshawn Lynch is an individual who comes out of Oakland, um, who if you hear him do interviews, he doesn't, code switch is language. Um, from the movie standpoint, um, Ryan Coogler is a, a movie producer who's produced the uh, Black Panther film. And if you hear him in interviews, he doesn't do the code switch. So I bring this up to say it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon when your culture is recognized, validated, and supported, how you don't feel the need to be impacted by the cultural bomb. Um, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, no, that's that's a really crazy phenomenon because that was funny you used Marshawn Lynch. That's like the first person I think of when when you mentioned like Oakland. Yep. Uh, that's the first person I I seen him like on either YouTube videos, interviews. He doesn't like switch up his voice at all. He just tells it straight as it is. Like just he lets it all go. However, like he just talks the way he like the way he talks. And I like, and like that, like, it gives you like a sense of like, kind of like how you say, not like trust, but like, mm -hmm. you feel like he's being genuine. Like he's uh -huh. being genuine. Like he's not, he's not covering up nothing. He's not like sugarcoating anything. He's just saying like what it is. So it makes you feel like you can like really trust the dude. And yeah, that's it's what all, I was like. It's an authenticity. Right? Authenticity. It's, yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. really genuine. And, and the thing is, why that's so trustworthy? Because you don't see that much. You don't hear. Yeah, you, come off yeah. Like um, real quick, I want to show you guys a quick, um, quick five-minute video, just to kind of for those who aren't familiar with either Marshawn Lynch or Ryan Coogler, um, 
I just want you guys to kind of be familiar with that. So give me one second. And this video is dope, not only because you can hear him not code switching, but if you listen to what he's talking about, the conversation is really dope. Can everybody see my screen or the blackness on the screen? Yeah. Okay, cool. One thing that was a central theme in the film was black identity. And this relationship between African Americans and Africans on the continent. Can you talk about what your relationship with the continent has been and, you know, what you see as the reconciliation between Africans and African Americans? <laughs> I mean, that's heavy, man. Like, I remember having a conversation uh, about my own identity when I was when I was very young, man. I, my, my parents had to have, sit me down and have it, you know, you, you black conversation. You know what I mean? And I think that um, it's not it's a conversation that parents have to have in this in this in this country, and I think all over the world, you know, because um, it's a real thing. If you don't understand. Not the fact that your skin looks like this, you know, but if you don't understand the fact that the world is going to treat you a certain way because of that, and you have to be, you have to be ready for that, you know, it could cost you your life if your parents don't have that conversation with you, you know. And so I had that conversation at an early age, and and what I found was, you know, I was a curious kid, and you know, so I, so it's like, you know, you know, we African American, and I was like, I was big on why, like, what does that mean, you know what I mean? And, and so we come from, we come from the continent of Africa, we come from this place that you see on the map in school, and that you see you know, on, on the globe at home, um, you know, but I was in the Bay Area. I was thousands and thousands as far away from, from the continent as you could be, you know, and still find black people, you know what I mean? Like, the next thing you hit is Hawaii, I guess, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, I had a, a lot of a lot of um, pain inside of me due to not being able to, you know, know, know my ancestry and only being able to, to access that wound. And, 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 what, I, and what, we, what we were taught, not to be long-winded, you know, but what we kind of taught uh, about our own African-American culture is that it's a bastardized culture. We taught that, you know, we lost, you know, the things that made us African. We don't have them anymore. You know what I mean? Like we, 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 we had to make do with the scraps. And, and when, I, when I sat down with Marvel and said, hey, yo, for me to write this script, I need to go to the continent. I need to go like right now. You know, um, <laughs> that, that, they were like, they were like, man, you know, you know, go. And, and, and I went and started in South Africa because, you know, it was really because Chadwick and Civil War and, and Dr. John Connie, they speak Kosa, the dialect in, in, on the continent. And I went, you know, I started there. <laughs> I, start, I, I, started, I started there. And, and, what I, and what I found was, was um, you know, what I found as soon as, I, as soon as I got there and I started, you know, and I was by myself, you know, and I, and I was hanging out with cats that was working in a hotel. And they took me back to their to they township. And, and, and they were like, hey, let's go do the ritual. We're going to go do the ritual. And I'm like, oh, ritual. So I'm expecting, like, painted face. And, and you know, like, like, you know, I'm expecting to go all the way in. Yeah. And, 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 and what they, and what they, and what we, we pulled up at our house, and it was a bunch of, it was a bunch of young cats standing outside. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, hmm, this feels familiar, you know? And then, you know, we go in and we walk to the house, and then all the OGs, you know, I say from age like 50 to 70, was, was, was sitting in one section. And I'm like, that's, what happens at my house on the weekends? So we keep, so we keep going, and we go into the kitchen, and the women are in there cooking, and they talking, and they cooking all this, all this food. And then you go out into the backyard, and there's some more young cats, you know, what I'm saying like my age, and they just they had just slaughtered a, uh, slaughtered a cow and a goat, and they, and they were, you know, cooking the food, and they were passing around this, this, this real, uh, this real cool African beer, you know, and everybody was drinking from the same, the same, the same. Uh, it was a, it was like a. Uh, Exactly, <laughs> Calabash. Everybody was drinking from that. They passing it back and forth, and and, and, I'm, and I'm like, man, what ritual is this? And it was like, oh yeah, this this you know I can't remember the name. We've been doing this for thousands of years. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, well, we do this same ritual back at, at home, <laughs> and, and then and then for them it was for them it was a no brainer. They were like, yeah, of course you do, cause y'all African, yeah. you know. And, and I realized then, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, right. Because, you know, whatever this evil thing that happened to us, you know what I'm saying? Unfortunately, they don't teach us anything beyond that, you know. Um, but, but, but what they did to us, there was no way they could wipe out what we were for thousands of years. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, and it was right. 
right something right there just made me completely whole. Like like I was like, oh man, we we've been African this whole time. When I stand outside, like when I when I hang with my family on on the block in Oakland or Richmond, and all the youngsters stand outside, and the, and my and my grandma is inside cooking. You know what I'm saying? And it, 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 we being Africans. You know, and, and and even though it was we were told it was you it, it was being hood or it was being something else. We was being true to what we've been for thousands and thousands of years. So I felt connected, you know, in a way that was that was that was very profound. Give him a round of applause, please. So again, um, I wanted you guys just one to hear, like he's on a, a very professional setting, right? He's talking about his his movie, and this is like a snippet of the interview, um, but. At the same time, right, you hear how he's not trying to sound professional, right? Um, I could have swore he was about to say nigga like three times and then he had to pull himself back, right? Like he just was being himself, right? Um, so there's something that comes with that. And, and again, me knowing the history of how Oakland as a, as a city embraced this notion of Ebonics is not happenstance that people from Oakland of this age demographic, they speak like that. And um, Ricardo, does he not sound a little bit like, not even a little bit, does he not sound like Marshawn Lynch? Yeah, he does kind of sound like him. Yeah, the way he uses, like, like the words like OGs, cat, like, every, like everything like that. So, yeah, it just does kind of sound like him. It's this Oakland. It's the Oakland vernacular. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's absolutely. So, again, um, and again, it, for me, it comes back to this question of value, right? And, and it's this, this notion that, who you are is enough, right? Um, and, and, I, and I think it's funny how Ryan Cooler articulates this notion of who we, who he is, right? He's like, oh, well, man, this is what we do back home in Oakland. He said, well, of course, because you're African. And he says, well, even though they try to position this as being ghetto hood or whatever, it's just us really being African, right? So again, this notion of not being victim to the cultural bomb, right? Even for black folks, when they tell us, yo, that's hood, that's ghetto, right? Hoop, big ass hoop earrings and long nails is ghetto. But now you see everybody in pop culture wearing big ass hoop earrings and long nails, right? Braids are unprofessional, but one of them Kardashian chicks could do it in it's pop culture, right? So it's not, it's about not falling victim to the cultural bomb. Um, let's get a couple of thoughts. You could be talking about the video that you just watched or anything we discussed in the past hour. Let me get two comments, comments and we'll close it out. Um, I liked how he, he, um, he said uh, he was doing the same things at home, how like they were African. And he didn't really know that until he's seen the other perspective of it. Yeah. That's what I like. Yeah. That's a really good point, Damien. Like, because you don't know what you're doing until you see the other side, right? And how, and really, for Americans, how important travel is, right? Because we are very much um, easily susceptible to what they call groupthink. And we just fall into these um, narratives and believe these narratives because we're not exposed to anything outside of American culture, right? Um, for example, where my my wife is from, Eritrea, they have an hour where you just go home, you eat lunch, you eat um, and you chill, take a nap, and then you come back to work, right? But from for us in this American paradigm, that seems so out of pocket. Like that stuff like that won't even happen, right? You got a thirty minute lunch. Or you may have an hour lunch, but you're not about to go home and chill and, and take a nap, right? That's out of context. So, you know, Damien, you're absolutely right. The the ability for travel to be helpful in expanding your vision of the world. Um, let's get one more comment before we call it a day. Dulce, what were your thoughts on today's course? Or the material cover, the video cover, what we talked about? I think it was relatable because everyone here is like has two cultures. So I think we all can relate with the video. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Um, it's dealing with this idea of double consciousness or two-ness, right? Existing within two separate worlds. 
Um, let me pull up our readings for next week before we call it a day. One moment. So we'll close out our conversations on relation um, with this reading, uh, Glissant Poetics of Relation. Um, it's a passage called The Open Boat. It's very short, um, but it's a poetic. So it has multiple meanings. Um, so take your time with it. Um, don't try not to take everything so literally because it is a poetic, right? So he's going to play and manipulate language. But we're still continuing this conversation around language. We're still continuing this conversation around language being able to uh, bring people together and this notion of relation. So that's the reading for next week. Glissant, Poetics of Relations. Um, you would have to have one journal entry for that. And then I'll close out our weeks four through seven. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. So again, just to not confuse. Glissant. Poetics of Relations. All right.